Okay, welcome to the class. My name is Mike Marsoon, and we're going to be talking about stone restoration and really what you need to know. Um, I'm not going to get too technical. There's no point. What you need to know is how to make money, and that's what we're going to discuss. When I started putting this class together, I got a lot of questions from students signing up for the seminar about what I was going to teach. Um, they're asking specifics. Are you going to teach this? Are you going to teach that? Uh, floor sanding, grinding, uh, polishing, cleaning, what type of sealing, what type of chemicals, on and on. And um, that to me seemed a little awkward because I'm the, the teacher and supposedly going to, part of that is designing what is going to be taught. That's just as important as how it's taught, but what's covered. But in this class, the emphasis is going to be on education and just overall understanding of stone and the processes. Um, it's kind of like those type of questions are, are kind of like a doctor or somebody that says they want to be a doctor and they go to med school and they say, well, I'm going to learn how to do remove appendixes and um, do remove tonsils, and I want to do hernia operations, and um, I want to do open heart surgery because I hear that's really good money, and um, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do those four things for a living, and I'm going to make some good money. But that's not quite the way it works in real life. What you have to do is learn the basics and become a doctor first and then you go on to specialize. So this class is going to teach a lot of the basics particularly with this chapter, the introduction, and get you ready to go on to specialize because you can't go out and be an expert in any one specialty until you know the fundamentals and um, until you know all the peripheral knowledge, your specific knowledge won't be effective. So let's talk about stone types. Now this is a real abbreviated um, uh, description of the different stone types. Uh, this, like I said, this could get way more technical, and um, you know you'd probably be real impressed with my teaching, but you wouldn't maybe retain it as well. And there's just too much to learn to get so technical, which with each different stone group. So what I did is took the definition from the um, ASTM definition, which is very basic. And I thought that's good. I like that. We're going to use that because it's so basic. And it breaks it down into granite, marble, greenstone, which I assume they mean the green types of stone, which is um, what they call serpentine stone, which is a hydrated magnesium silicate. It's, it's really um, technically not through with its metamorphosis process and it's, it's still um, turning into something. Uh, sandstone, limestone, and slate. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the 
what you would do is take all of those classifications, those six, and then put them into two very simple classifications, which is going to tell you how we're going to work on it. And that would be alkaline, mineral-based, or igneous, which is your siliceous, non-acid sensitive stone. Your mineral base is, uh, your alkaline mineral base is obviously going to be your acid sensitive stone. So for the purpose of how you're going to treat it, what types of chemicals you're going to use, and how you're going to clean and seal, you really just need to know those, those two things. Um, the specifics actually of sealers, you want to you want to break it down into the lower six groups because certain sealing components work better on granite and um, certain other ones work better on limestone. So it is important to know all of that as well, but that's that's a little more advanced. Okay, uh, the common building stones that we see every week out there. The granite, which is usually polished. You're going to see it on countertops, um, mostly because it's the best material for countertops. It's not acid sensitive. It... Um, it's relatively scratch resistant on the on a most scale of hardness. It's actually equal to steel. And you can take a blade, you can take a, a sharp knife and drag it across a granite countertop. And it's not gonna scratch because it's so close to steel. You'll you'll feel that blade start to want to grab, but because of the slickness of the countertop. It, it can't quite grab, so it's not going to it's not going to scratch. And if you use a granite countertop as a cutting board, you're not going to damage it. All you'll do is really you'll just damage your knives. Your knives will get dull. Um, but granite is the material for countertops. It will stain. It needs to be sealed. Certain types of granite. Actually, technically, most of the countertop material you see out there is not technically granite because it doesn't have the um, the makeup of minerals that that granite um, has. But they're called granite. They it acts a lot like granite. Most of them are non-acid sensitive, and it's it's close enough. It's not really worth splitting hairs. Uh, quartzite is very similar to granite. It's got uh, mica schist a lot. A lot of times you'll see um, just kind of sparkling in the sun and some of it is actually more of a mica schist than it is quartzite. But um, but it looks the same. Um, it can be very porous. It's very hard, um, and it usually quartzite usually comes in a, a natural cleft finish. You see it cut into squares, or you'll see it used as a flagstone, typically right out of the crate with um, irregular shapes and sizes. Um, the same with slate. You see it used as flagstone a lot, or it'll be cut square. Um, Slate can be acid sensitive, but it's not um, greatly acid sensitive. You can use some acids on it, and it's going to be okay. Anorthosite is your black, what people call your black granites, um, and it, it is an anorthosite. It's not a granite. It's higher in the mica and feldspar. And it doesn't have the the quartz foils that you technically that you typically see in granite. 
the serpentine is the hydrated magnesium silicate. It it's, doesn't polish quite the same as marbles. It has dolomite veins, which are very acid sensitive. And sometimes, I mean, with most polishing powders that are made for marble, if you use it on serpentine, it won't quite bring up that that green, but the, the these white veins will just jump out, and you'll have a, a real inconsistent finish there. So serpentines need to be polished um, mechanically much more than with a chemical reaction from some of the acid polishing powders. Um, limestone is a very broad term. It, it, there's quite a bit of limestone out there. It's very popular these days and it typically has a soft honed finish rather than a polished finish, although you do see it polished quite a bit. The pores are more open in limestone typically and um, that's why they don't try to polish it as much. Marble, um, usually highly polished. Now it's more popular as a honed finish or tumbled or brushed or blasted. Um, they're doing a lot of really neat things with marble these days. Um, but uh, still very popular in your dimensional cut stone um, installed with a highly polished finish. Sandstone is very popular as a as a flagstone, um, irregular shapes and sizes, and um, with a cleft finish. You will see it cut into squares. You don't see it gauged that often or with a honed finish, but but it is getting more popular. Basalt, and uh, which is kind of like a lava. We have a lot of cut lava out here. And it's usually just comes with a saw cut finish, although it can be um, high, highly honed as well. The agglomerates are kind of similar to like a breccia on aceta, where you have, um, it, it looks a lot like terrazzo, where you have pieces that are bound together in a cementitious matrix or a resin based matrix. So you see big chips of stone and it's all bound together and they'll they'll come in square tiles or um, whatever shapes and sizes of the of the tiles, but it's a manufactured stone. Onyx <coughs> is similar to marble. Um, it's transparent. You can backlight it and it comes through. It looks really beautiful. Um, there's only a couple of different varieties. Um, the multicolor and uh, a lemon colored onyx. Um, they're not that popular. You do see it around, but it's very expensive. And, um, you know, you run into it every every once in a while. It's pr pretty easy to, to recognize because, like I said, there's only really two types. Uh, travertine is very popular. It's very inexpensive and it's very easy to work with. Um, it is, it's formed, it's like a limestone where there's thermal gases coming up from the earth and the hydrostatic pressure creates voids um, vertically up through the stone. When they cut the travertine, they used to cut it with the grain typically, and then once those cavities are filled and the, the tiles are processed, you could see a definite grain to the to the tiles. They would either they would cut it lengthwise with the the outline of what they cut out. Um, and then it would be installed that way with the grain going all the same way. Or they you would uh, basket weave it where one tile, the grain, would be going one way and then the adjacent tile, the grain, would be at a perpendicular angle. 
um, now what you see um, typically, I mean almost exclusively, is what they call flurry cut travertine. That's the Italian term. Or cross cut travertine, which is where it's not cut along the grain, it's cut against the grain. So it has a more consistent look to it and um, more of a marble type um, pattern to it rather than a, a grain, which makes it look more like a, a wood or, or something that has grain running from end to end. Uh, but travertine these days is processed in many different ways, mostly honed. You don't see it polished quite as much. And you see it tumbled and brushed is, is extremely popular these days. Uh, the different stone finishes that we see, honed. Uh, Probably the most popular finish coming out of the the quarries today, or maybe polished. I don't. They they would be they would be close to one another. Um, but honed is definitely gaining momentum. That's kind of the the uh, design trend these days. Um, polished. Uh, Still very popular. It brings the color out of the stone more, and you're you're never going to see more beauty in the stone than with a polished finish. It's where you you can see right through the surface into the stone, and it's very very beautiful. Um, flamed is we're talking about granite, where they actually take a a nozzle with I mean a, a tool with the several nozzles that that blows a torch onto the the surface of the granite and it causes the quartz to heat up and pop and this flakes the stone evenly and gives it a very natural texture similar to if you went out to Yosemite Valley or anywhere that has natural granite and just felt the side of the mountain that's what you're feeling there and that natural texture that's exactly like the flamed texture of the granite so it's it's real nice river washed is a technique using water blasting and it leaves a smoother finish than the flamed it will be more aggressive on the veins and create little deeper channels and that's where it gets the term river wash but it's a real pretty finishing technique. Uh, antiqued also known as brushed is where in the finishing process they take uh, DuPont Tynex brushes or monofilaments which are in brushes, and these these Tynex monofilaments have silicon carbide, silicon carbide impregnated into the bristles. So they actually do some sanding, but as the bristles float, they will attack the softer areas of the stone, and they will leave the harder areas of the stone. So what it does in a way is it kind of hardens the stone and it leaves a very beautiful kind of almost like a stamped leather type of a look. Um, those brushes come in various grit sizes on up to 500 grit. So with these brushes there is a very nice polished look but it's a bumpy um, natural texture. And it's very nice. It's one of my favorite stones, and it's very easy to work on. Um, tumbled is where they literally tumble the stones in a big vat or a, a tumbler with a little bit of silica sand in there, and they bang against each other, and 
leaves a real soft finish. It eats away at the softer veins, similar to uh, river wash finish, and uh, chips the edges, kind of rounds the corners a little bit, and gives it a real old world, um, natural kind of a antique look to it. Um, cleft is the natural finish of a stone um, when slate or sandstone or or any of these these types of stones are are split with a chisel it's what you get it's it's going to be even it's going to be smooth in some spots but there's going to be high spots there's going to be lower spots and um and that's the way it's installed that's that's something that you'll see um quite a bit um filled and unfilled we're talking about certain types of stones particularly travertine which require filling because there's cavities that open up when it's ground or when it's cut so you will see a lot of travertine out there that's unfilled and they do that for the aesthetics they, they like that look to it um, and uh, it re obviously requires more maintenance because those cavities are getting filled with dirt all the time. Uh, blasted finish is, is sandblasting. Takes a lot of color away from the stone as the as the silica sand shatters the crystals of the stone. Um, you will see this done picture framed around the edges of the stone tiles, or you'll see it. Um, the entire tile. Uh, you don't see it very often. It's more for decorative uh, railing, um, vertical applications, or something um, that is unique. You won't see it typically in large installations, just kind of only in a, a trim piece. Uh, hammered, bush hammered is a technique with um, tumblers that hammer the surface and give it a um, you know almost like a um, needle gun type of a finish and again that's usually for wall surfaces they they realize not to try to use that on floors because it would get so dirty so quick but for trim pieces or just architectural accents Striated is where there are um, saw cuts running the length of the stone. And again, just like blasted and hammered, it's used architecturally as an accent. And you don't see that on floors very often. You actually don't see it around too much at all. And saw cut finish, you'll see this with travertine. Um, Adequin, Cantera stone, a lot of your more um, absorbent, porous stones, they just, because the pores are so open and they know they're not going to get any color by further honing it or filling and polishing it, they'll just cut it and what you see is what you get. Um, the pores are so open that it's not worthwhile taking it in taking it any further. Okay, I think installation methods are very important to talk about. As a stone restoration contractor, you really are expected to be an expert. You're expected to walk into a job and just know everything about that floor. And you are expected to be able to comment on the installation, whether it was good or bad, or um, be able to analyze it and, and get a, give a good um, opinion on the quality of the installation. Um, mud set mortar is what you they typically call thick set installation where 
there is a mud. It can either be a wet mud or a dry pack mud. The, the correct way is with a dry pack mud, with, which is one to three approximately sand and cement mixed into with very little water so it's still relatively fluffy the the test if it's got enough water in it is to grab a handful of this um, this dry pack they call it and clinch it with your hand and if you can open your hand and it stays together then that means it's it's good. That's what you want. You, you want to see enough moisture in there for it to hold together. Um, now, this this type of mortar installation is usually a very thick mortar bed. Um, you know, up to two inches. I've seen it as high as three inches, um, and it will vary because when the floor is installed, the top of the tiles that are installed are supposed to be a flat plane. Um, the concrete slab or the, the wood subfloor below may have low spots and high spots. So when you see a marble floor that's getting installed correctly, you should be able to take a long straight edge and put it on top and it'll be flat and level. But then if you look at the reveal from the bottom of the tiles, that line, to the concrete floor below, you may see where the mortar bed goes from one inch to an inch and a half, back down to an inch, and then maybe on up to two inches, as the, depending on the quality of the slab that's below it and how flat that is. So, but that's what the, the mortar set is for, to be able to take up that gap and create a nice flat floor and um, to bond well with the tile. Usually with a mud set mortar installation, the installer is going to do what they call back butter to the floor and the tile itself where they take thin set mortar, which is used for tile setting, and skim the back of the tile and then skim the floor as well. And then Put the dry pack mortar down, fluff it up, and get it consistent in its density, and then take the tile and beat that in to compress this thin set, this uh, this uh, dry pack mortar, and using a level, create a flat plane. The thin set mortar method, unfortunately, is more common, and that's using a tile setter's mortar, which is um, a much finer silica sand, a lot of lime, and then white cement. And that is, it's designed to be used with a notch trowel where it can be skimmed onto the floor, combed on, and the, the, um, where the notches are, the thin set's going to stay upright. And then the ceramic tile is compressed into that, and the ceramic tile gets good coverage. Um, when it's used with a 12 inch tile, the plane is so big and the edges of the tile are so such a so sharp um, that it's hard to get the floor really flat and to rise up above the floor to create a flat plane using the tiles. A lot of thin set has to be used. So uh, an installer will comb the floor and, and trowel that out, but then also take a another trowel, a margin trowel, and scoop out plops, little blobs, maybe golf ball sizes, and put that around on the floor where there appears to be low spots, and then press the tile down into that thin set to create the flat plane. When that is done, there is typically a very low coverage rate on the tile with the thin set. And these are the floors that you can knock around with with a broom handle or a golf ball or whatever. And you'll hear hollow spots all over the place. Um, a lot of installers do what's called a five dot 
um, method where they'll they'll comb the pin set onto the, the concrete and then they will um, put five dots, four in the corner and then one in the middle. Or if you're lucky, they'll do six where they'll do three, three, and three, or nine. Um, when this happens, you're still only getting about a 50% coverage rate. So um, it's very difficult to use thin set and get a good um, coverage rate on the tiles when you're setting a 12 by 12 or larger um, stone tile. Okay, now the grout <laughs> for installation, there's two types, sanded or non-sanded, or sometimes they call it unsanded. Um, unsanded grout is for grout joints an eighth of an inch or less. Sanded grout is for grout joints an eighth of an inch or larger than one eighth of an inch. Um, the sand keeps the grout from sagging when it's when it's in a larger area and it keeps it from cracking as it shrinks and as it dries. Um, so for most dimensional tile floors, say you know your <coughs> your typical marble floor with with uh, 12 by 12 or 16 inch. Um, squares, they're going to be a pretty tight joint, an eighth of an inch or less. Sometimes you'll see them with what's called a butt joint where they put them right close together. Um, now though, that should always be unsanded grout. But when it's on that line of, of um, an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit smaller, you'll see quite a bit that installers have used sanded grout. And um, it's not the right way to do it. When, when you see the sanded grout and you have to resurface the floor to flatten it, um, you, there could be problems because a lot of that sand, silica sand from the grout could come out and get stuck under your abrasives and just give you a real hard time as you're trying to polish. So watch out for that. I have had jobs where they wanted to sand the floor and they use sandy grout. They wanted to do a, a lippage job of flattening and I had to have them remove the grout and put in non-sandy grout. So that's the right way. Non-sandy grout when it's sanded, when, there's, when you do a lippage job and you sand the whole floor flush, it will actually, as it cures over the years, and you go back to polish it, it will polish the same as the stone itself. So it's very important on um, this type of a polished finished stone floor that sanded grout is not used. You only, you only want to see non-sanded grout on a polished marble tile floor. Uh, okay, expansion joints, that's where about every 150 square feet or so there is a grout joint that's a little wider than the rest of the grout joints typically. And there is a urethane um, component that is put in there that allows the floor to expand and contract with temperature variations. Um, without the expansion joint, it can cause the floor to buckle in the heat as the tile heats up quicker than the concrete underneath, which is cool, and it expands and it can cause the floor to to lift and delaminate, and then you get a bunch of hollow tiles or cracks or all sorts of strange things. Um, walls. Marble walls, they can be installed. If it's tiles, they'll be installed with thin set. Typically, either it's you cannot do a mud set or a mortar set um, wall um, unless it's pre-floated. Sometimes the wall will get a, a vertical coat of um, mortar, like a like a lath and plaster treatment, to make the wall solid before the the um, tile goes on and that's actually the right way to do things is with a mortar um, sub base and then thin set right over the top of that. 
um, with marble or granite slabs, you will typically see a mortar installation, I mean a, uh, I'm sorry, a mechanical installation where the tiles are drilled out on the side and then a wire is epoxied into them and it's flared out to come through the back of the tile and then that wire will be wrapped around a nail or a screw and then packed with thin set or casting plaster. Um, there's also mechanical systems out there where there's a, a nut and a bolt and a bracket set up where this something similar to that can be done but it's anchored and it's adjustable by the threads on the bolt. So there's different ways that um, walls can be installed mechanically. Um, and it's okay for a three-quarter inch slab to be installed mechanically and basically to be hollow behind it because a wall is not really meant to be structural. Nobody's going to be walking on top of it. So it's okay if it cannot bear weight. Okay, slip sheet. What's also known as a crack isolation membrane is a treatment done to the concrete slab prior to installation, which is installed with a pliable mastic. And this will um, allow the slab to crack without causing the floor to crack as well. Countertops and slabs, they're basically fabricated in one piece and installed with um, some type of a mastic or thin set or epoxy. It depends on the style of the installer. And um, the seams are filled with, with stone epoxy. Okay, uh, the anatomy of a dimensional stone tile. The thickness, which is also known as the, the calibration. This is for your typical uh, marble tile. You're talking about three-eighths of an inch. Um, the edges, edges of the tile. Um, the edges will be saw cut, but then on the upper part of the tile, what you see um, will be different. You'll have just that that plain saw cut edge, which will be jagged, and um, it'll chip very easily if it's not level with the rest of the tiles. Um, an aris edge is what most dimensional stone tiles have, which is just a, a slight bevel that is put on, on the, in the factory. And this bevel serves two purposes. Number one, it'll help to hold more grout in that gap. Number two, it provides a little ramp that if one tile is slightly higher, it's not going to chip. It's going to um, allow things to glide over that that tile without chipping. It also gives the tile more of a, a finished look with a, just a plain saw cut tile. There is a good amount of chipping along that edge and it just doesn't look nice. It doesn't look finished. A cushioned edge, or they'll also call it a pillowed edge, is where the edge of the tile actually has a very slight bullnose, what's called a demi bullnose which is just kind of tucking it over a little bit and um, and reset, causing the grout to be a little bit more recessed. Um, this won't wrap around onto the side very much, but is limited to the top of the tile where, and then it wraps down um, a small percentage down through the thickness of the tile. Uh, chiseled edge is an edge that's got a chiseled finish and it's done with with hand tools to give a rough jagged look to the tile similar to what you see on this this PowerPoint presentation here this the background there is kind of looks like a a uh, slate tile with a chiseled edge 
Um, okay, filler waxes and dyes. This is what we call doctoring. Um, you'll see it on granite quite a bit um, in a lot of marble tiles where they'll produce it to a certain point and they don't quite get the color that they want. So they will slurry the stone with with um, some kind of a dye that's in a, a in some sort of a wax or a resin, and this will permanently stain the stone the color that they want and um, bring out the the intrinsic color. Sometimes it'll just be a a clear resin that dries hard, just something to bring out the natural color or something to fill the pores so that the stone will hold the shine much better. Um, cer certain stones have pretty good sized voids, like travertine. Those are all filled in the factory with the travertine filler um, as part of the process. And then the grinding continues, and that fill ends up flush, and it polishes consistently with the rest of the stone. Sometimes it doesn't polish consistently because it it uh, shrinks when it's in the, the void that it was filling. So it doesn't hold the polish quite the same. Um, the face of the tile obviously is the, the surface that you see and it will have various finishes and dressing. What, what dressing is, uh, you have a marble tile and to polish a marble tile to bring it to a high polish is called dressing. And that can be done through chemicals or through waxes and um, um, impregnating treatments. Okay, um, it's uh, patterns. Uh, the most typical patterns that you see is well, by far the most common pattern is obviously just a square pattern with a square tile, 12 by 12 or 16 by 16. A running bond pattern is similar to a bricklayer's pattern where um, in one direction the, the joints are all the same in one line. In the other direction, they kind of stair step along and the grout joint comes into the middle of the adjacent tile. So, you know, just just like a brick brick layer pattern. Um, the Ashler pattern, also known as a Versailles pattern, is where there's a bunch of random pieces set in a pattern that all ties into each other. Uh, we have pictures of that coming up. Um, flagstone is actually, that is a installation pattern. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot somebody call you up and say, hey, I want you to come and clean my flagstone. But there really, there's no such thing as flagstone. Flagstone is a pattern. It's not a type of a stone. You can have quartzite flagstone. You can have slate flagstone. Uh, limestone, flagstone, you know, it's all flagstone as long as it's just a random pattern of um, of rough pieces that were just kind of picked up and randomly chosen to fit the void of the pieces that are all around them. Uh, random pattern is is similar to a Versailles pattern just a different pattern. Um, terrazzo on Paladian. Um, terrazzo is, is marble chips mixed into a cementitious uh, matrix, which is floated onto the floor, similar to pouring concrete. <coughs> and then it's gone over with a, a heavy-duty grinder, which exposes the, the uh, marble chips. Uh, Paladian is... is the same, but it's um, done with much bigger stone chips, closer to you know eight inches or 
or uh, six inches. So um, it almost looks like a a flagstone pattern, but it's it's all flush and polished. Very um, you don't see it very often. It's it's a, a very old method. Basket weave and herringbone. Those are usually with a a tile size that is twice as long as it is wide, like a 4x8 tile or a 6x12 tile, and they're just stacked in a certain way that where you have two in one direction, two in another direction, that's the basket weave. And the herringbone is where they're, they're stacked um, at a 45 degree angle to each other, creating you know what looks like a herringbone type of a pattern. Uh, custom patterns would be anything that anybody could come up with. You see some wild stuff out there. Um, there's a slide in the presentation where somebody, a, a slate job that I did, where they took each piece and cut them out of a big slab and made sort of like a, a serpentine um, curve. They're all cut in with the same pattern and they follow each other and it's very beautiful when you look at the floor it, it almost looks like the floor has a wave occurring on it and, um, so a custom pattern could be just anything under the sun um, the current trend is definitely with the softer finishes but that doesn't really matter to you. What matters to you is, is what you're going to have to work on and what is going to delegate that really is where you live. Now, I have always lived on the West Coast and even, you know, right off the West Coast here in Hawaii. And um, so development is a lot younger so we have much more of the current design trends out here. The neighborhoods that I work in now are, um, the houses are very new. They're, they're all less than five years old. So the design trends are obviously very current. What we see is a lot of honed finish, a lot of brushed finish, tumbled, and, um, geez, you know, that's that's about it. A lot of cleft, natural finish, quartzite, and slate. Um, some flame granite. And um, hardly ever polished. We'll, we'll see some in the master bathrooms. That tends to be where people get a little more opulent. Um, and, you know, that'll be typical in the master bathrooms. But in the, the main floors of the house and the, the outside um, bal balconies and lanais or whatever you call them, where, wherever you're from, verandas, um, those will be with the, the honed and um, soft, natural looking finish. Um, also slip resistance, good for outside. Um, if you live back east and your, your market is uh, New York City, Boston, or or even Florida, or you know, vacation areas where people are trying to show off with all their money, um, you're going to see more polished stone, um, highly polished floors, walls, countertops. Um, so, and, and it's basically based on how old that area is. Um, and uh, it tends to be consistent in these communities. You, I mean, you may see somebody that remodels an old condo or whatever, but they usually stick with the style of the place, which is going to be one or the other. Okay, now we're going to start looking at some some actual photos of jobs that I've done, and and just to help describe what the finishes are. Uh, this is a travertine floor that had extreme lippage. The floor was loose. It was injected with epoxy. And um, 
that ep epoxy injection caused the floor to rise and we had lips that were a good quarter of an inch so we had to do some extreme grinding you can see this is an older travertine floor you can tell by the pattern that it has a, a grain that runs lengthwise like I talked about earlier um, you can see some of the the kind of the pink areas which is the color of fill that was used on this floor to fill the voids um, they had to literally drill thousands of holes all over this floor and inject it with epoxy and then we came back in with a stone epoxy and filled them well what we did before we filled them we took a a chisel or a, um, a hole punch and we shattered those holes just to give it more of a natural look. We didn't want a perfectly round hole that we were filling with epoxy because it would, it would be obvious what it was. So we went through and just shattered all of them and uh, made it look really natural. And it was it was really hard to find the places where the epoxy was injected after we were done. But anyways, in regards to finish, this floor was finished at a 800 grit resin diamond pad uh, on a on a planetary head machine and that's all we did there was no buffing we just brought it all the way up and stopped at 800 and this is what we had and we sealed it and everybody was happy okay this is what i call a, a medium honed finish this is a Beaumonnier limestone uh, that is pretty porous. If you really got down to look at it closely or with a micro microscope or a magnifying glass, you'll see you'll see a bunch of really fine voids in the stone. So if you really tried to polish this, it would still kind of have like a satin sheen because the pores aren't real closed on the stone itself. So um, so for that reason, obviously, most of the work on these types of floors is going to be cleaning because they do hold on to that dirt a lot more effectively and um, they're, they're going to need a lot more frequent cleaning. Um, this is where the, the pressure extractor equipment works really well, getting the dirt out of the embedded um, pores once the proper chemical is applied to loosen that those soils that that the pressure equipment can lift it out so but the finish is what we're looking at here this is what I call a medium honed finish now this one <coughs> this photo isn't quite as good because of the fact that um, it's overcast <coughs> but um, this is a, a low honed. <coughs> they they call this um, Texas <coughs> shell stone, something like that, I believe. Um, it looked like the coral stone. It's it's very common and very porous. Um, you wouldn't dream of trying to put a polished surface on it because it wouldn't look right. Um, this is just a before and after that I took of the cleaning. But in the reflection with the light, you're not going to see any any light refraction at all on this. It's going to be totally flat. And obviously, it's going to require a lot more cleaning. The, the more honed the finish is, the more the pores of the stone are open, and the more it's going to hold on to dirt, and the more it's going to absorb whatever it comes in contact with. So... But this is what I call a low honed finish. Okay, this is a polished marble floor with uh, its crema marfil with black granite or rather anorthosite um, dots or inserts or they'll, they'll call them keys. Um, the corner of the tiles are cut off and then these little pieces are stuck in there and it's a very elegant look. 
um, it can be very interesting to work on if you're doing diamond sanding. Imagine you have to to treat the whole floor like you would the black granite. So um, they end up paying a lot more to have this floor worked on because of what they used in the keys. So you'll you'll see designers um, do this from time to time. They got this great idea. Oh, this looks good with this and they just look at the colors and they don't think of what it's going to take for maintenance and they can create some real problems based on the materials that they put together um, but it's a problem for the owner it's not a problem for you because you still have to do it right and you just have to charge whatever it's going to take to do it right and so this is one of those instances crema marfil which is highly acid sensitive right next to anorthosite, which is completely non-acid sensitive. And the chemicals that you would clean the cream of Raphael with would burn the anorthosite. And the chemicals that you clean the anorthosite with would burn the cream of Raphael. So, interesting combination. Um, this is uh, Ashler Pattern Travertine. This is actually Kelsey Grammer's house, Frazier, in Maui. Um, the uh, travertine was unfilled and had a natural uh, finish around the edges. Uh, what you'll see a lot is the travertine comes unfilled, but then when it's installed, um, the the installer will go ahead and slurry the whole floor with the grout and then they will end up filling it with grout which is not a not bad um, but um, you know it might not be what the designer wanted to see so sometimes you'll see it where they just used a grout bag and they were careful not to get it into the fill or sometimes you'll see where they just slurried the whole floor and they just went ahead and took it upon themselves to fill all the voids and you know actually that's what I would do if, if it was my house because I don't like those big holes everywhere but um, it might not necessarily be what the designer had in mind but anyways this is um, the Ashler pattern which you can see repeats itself every every so often and um, it's a honed finish travertine. This is a limestone in a flag pattern, flagstone pattern, but where each piece, instead of they them picking a piece up and just finding one that fits best, and the grout joint will grow or shrink. To, to fill the gap, um, each piece here was cut in to fit the adjacent pieces, keeping a nice even half inch grout joint. So what you're looking at here is a very expensive installation where each piece was cut after it was, there was a template made and um, Every inch of tile there was was cut to fit. So I don't even want to think of how long this floor took to install or how expensive it was. But it, it's a very nice installation. Now this is a, your typical flagstone. Um, it's quartzite. And... Um, where they just start at one end and they'll pick up a piece and they'll try it and see what fits. And they may cut off a corner here and there or trim a piece slightly to make it fit as nice as possible. But the grout joints, as you can see, some areas are a half inch, some areas they're an inch. Um, and they'll grow and they'll shrink with the 
the shape of the tiles. So uh, this is, you know, your typical textbook flagstone installation. And uh, the material, once again, is a cleft finish quartzite. I like this picture. This is a, a granite. Um, you can see the the blue foils. Um, it's absolutely beautiful when you when you walk past the countertop. Different foils will catch the light and 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 flash, and then they'll go away, and another one will come up and flash, and just absolutely beautiful. I'm not quite sure what this is called, but this is a polished granite countertop. This is another honed travertine, um, not quite as highly honed as the first one that we saw. The travertine quality is much lower. Um, we sanded the floor just to flush out the the edges here. You can see um, nice pattern, uh, interesting floor. And um, this is what's called the large format tile installation, where the tiles, where these are actually slabs, three quarters of an inch thick, um, that were all custom cut to fit next to each one. Very, very precise grout joints and uh, very skilled uh, work in put this in. Okay, this is another honed ashlar pattern. Um, you can see a nice reflection from the clouds there lit up and the, the tree trunk um, reflecting um, unfilled, but this one was also filled with grout and with chiseled, chiseled edges. Really cool floor. It's one of my personal favorites. I like the natural look, um, but still with a nice sheen like this. So I'd call this a medium home as well, maybe even a high home. Um, this is that, that custom pattern that I referred to previously where um, you can, well, just look at it. Um, you look at this at an angle, and I mean, you can see it. It looks like it's going up and down. Tremendous amount of work went into this floor. Um, the material is slate. It's a cleft finished slate, but very smooth. Um, as these were split with a chisel, they they didn't leave much um, much of a jagged surface. They left a very smooth surface. This is a cleft finish quartzite cut into the dimensional tile. Um, you can see that the installer blended it fairly well, and that um, that the installation was done at a 45 degree angle diagonal pattern. This is <coughs> a low honed finish brushed brushed finish travertine unfilled. And on this one, they were careful not to to fill with grout um, the areas that were unfilled. And um, very soft, very non-slip. You can see that it, it doesn't have quite as much color as the other more highly honed surfaces. The more a stone is processed, the more it's sanded, the more it's honed the more the color is going to come out. So when you see something with a soft finish, it's going to, the color is going to be washed out. When you see something more highly polished, the colors are always going to be much deeper. So this is travertine unfilled with a square pattern 
approximately um, 18 inch tile. This is a close up of what's called a brushed finish. This is also travertine. This is cross cut travertine that has been filled, but a lot of the fill has come out through the brushing process. Um, but with the, the Tynex um, carbide brushes, um, it leaves a nice finish uh, with a natural kind of a, uh, like I said, a stamped leather texture. Uh, very, very popular. It's the new thing and um, very easy to work on, as you're going to learn later on in this, in this course. This is multicolor slate. Um, there's several different types of slate. There's black. There's green is very popular. Green is very durable and um, and much harder. Um, there's a china gold, um, which is very soft. And then there's there's this multicolor. Um, they're all going to have your cleft finish. They're all split by some poor Chinese people making probably 10 cents an hour and then hand stacked. And they're, they're cut to size um, at a factory and brought to us. Very inexpensive. But, but nice when it's installed correctly and has a good sealer on it. The color comes out quite a bit and it can be pretty beautiful. But as you can see here on the left, when it's a little bit old and the sealer has worn off, the impregnating color enhancing sealer has worn off, it can look pretty dull. This is, <coughs> a again, an unfilled travertine where they were careful not to fill the voids when they did the grout work. Uh, it's got a chiseled edge and a, a high honed finish. And it's set on a diagonal pattern, balanced, where you can see a full corner on both sides of the tile, and uh, with the soldier course around the border, a, 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 a perimeter border. This is a Versailles pattern with a cushioned edge or a pillowed edge where the, the edge is just slightly bullnosed um, and creates a nice, interesting finish. The stone is filled. It's travertine, filled and honed. Nice color. Very, very nice look. Um, the problem with these is where the cushioned edges and the tile kind of rolls and you have a recess. Um, it can be hard to clean if you're using a mechanical method, a brush or a pad. It's not going to quite get down in there. So with these, you're kind of limited. You almost have to use chemicals to, to do a consistent cleaning on them. Okay, common stone problems. Um, Spalling, and I got I got photos for just about all of these because it's it's kind of hard to describe um, what some of these are. But spa spalling is where um, some of the softer parts of the stone they call it a mud vein, where it's it's a vein of minerals that aren't of the same density or they're not bound together the same as the matrix of the stone <coughs> through hydrostatic pressure or um, just being washed or pressure washed they will deteriorate and big pieces of the stone you know even up to like 25 cent pieces will will flake off and you'll just have little pits all over the place 
it's more common with certain stones than others. Um, Jerusalem gold, you'll see a lot. Um, and another peach colored stone, I just can't recall the name. It's, it's you know, you can almost guarantee you're going to see it in water areas next to shower doors or next to exterior walls where there might be some moisture wicking into the slab that's that's got to come up. Um, you'll see this problem. Uh, efflorescence is a moisture problem where moisture from the slab underneath and is just making its way to the surface and um, the moisture goes away into the air, but the minerals that were carried in the moisture leave a deposit on the top of the stone and um, it looks like a little white crust or uh, or like snow. Um, cracks and slab cracks, when the slab cracks underneath and then it radiates up into the stone because there wasn't a slip sheet used or a, a crack isolation membrane. Um, loose hollow tiles, like I talked about before, it's an installation deficiency. Um, and <clears throat> there are ways to fix it, but it's not easy. <clears throat> Decomposition, where typically in slate or quartzite or limestone, there's a moisture problem, and the stone will start to rot, literally flake and um, just loses its integrity altogether. Insoluble salt staining, <coughs> um, where there are certain chlorides and nitrates that are in the mortar bed and they wick up into the stone, which will have a certain type of stone that has some transparent properties like a granite, certain types of granite or limestone, and it will um, it will cause a dark spot that looks like moisture, but it's not, and it won't go away. Um, failed surface coatings. This is where um, a certain type of surface sealer was used, and um, it's delaminating, and um, it looks terrible. Etching which is through uh, acid in the food or whatever that's, that's got onto the surface of the stone and left little white edge marks, usually in a, a little donut type of pattern from a, a soft drink or whatever, the bottom of the glass was set back down. Or it could be from spills of lemon juice, <coughs> vinegar, whatever. Um, Poor quality polishing, you'll see inconsistencies in the stone because of um, just a bad factory process. Um, lippage, uneven tiles that were installed, a bad installation. Mineral staining, um, irrigation overspray, or um, something that's dripping onto the stone. Um, and the water's drying and the minerals are staying behind. You know, the very, very beginnings of like a, a stalagmite starting to form. Uh, biological staining. Biological staining can be from leaves or wood or tannin, mold. Um, any kind of a growth, it's pretty easy to clean. It pressure washes off real, real easy, and and the color can disappear with the right type of cleaners, bleach or peroxide. Attack it pretty well and kill it. Internal rusting, um, <coughs> where the iron and the limestone will is exposed to moisture and it oxidizes, and the stone will tart, start to turn orange. Color fading, this is pretty typical with travertine and other limestones. So the color fading um, is just from the sun um, or from certain stones 
uh, drying out certain stones that have natural oils in them. The, in the sun, they'll dissipate or just kind of flash off over the years. Um, so there are certain ways to remedy that with color enhancing sealers or in stone that you can't really bring it back. At least you can use uh, UV resistant silicones that will help to um, slow that process. Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to go into some photographs of the actual problems. This is a um, dark emperor marble, polished marble countertop. Um, you can see etch marks. This is actually a bar top that was refinished recently, and um, the owners had a party, and uh, I think they must like margaritas. Um, but you can see where there's little drips or, um, you know, the the drink went over the edge of the glass and they put it down and burnt pretty darn good into this newly finished countertop. So this is just acid etching from, from cocktails. Uh, close up again of a of an acid etch. Sometimes you got to get a little angle with the light to make it show up. Sometimes it sticks out like a sore thumb. It depends on how dark the stone is. Um, kind of a, a litmus test that I use is if you drag your fingernail across it and it it scratches. I mean you hear that eek kind of a finger fingernails on the chalkboard sign sound. Um, then you know you got to do some serious diamond sanding. If you can run your fingernails across and it's relatively smooth, then um, it's something that could be removed just with chemicals or buffing compounds. Um, this is a chemical etching. Um, there was some Tylex applied to the shower walls here, a, a well-meaning cleaning person trying to trying to clean it real well it's used um, this acid based cleaner and just fried the stone so you'll see this quite a bit around um, fixtures on marble countertops and on um, marble showers particularly the the valve wall with all the, the plumbing on it so um, it takes a lot of work to sand that out because this etching can be very deep. So you want to make sure if you're doing a shower, you're going to look closely to see if there's any of that there because if you take that on, it becomes your responsibility. Um, this is the spalling where you can see in the tile in the middle there, the lower left-hand corner, and uh, along that whole edge through moisture, and uh, wicking up through the surface of the tile, big pieces of stone that have flaked off. Um, I like to repair these using a grout mix that's the same color. Um, it tends to be more of a permanent repair because the grout will fill that void and then you can sand it smooth and flush so it looks very natural like the stone, but the grout will allow everything to breathe like it needs to. If you fill that with epoxy and grind it, it'll be a harder um, fill. It, it won't um, scrape out as easily, but that piece of epoxy that you put in there, it will flake out in a, you know, probably within a year because that epoxy is not letting it breathe and that's the problem that happened in the first place or why it happened in the first place. So. That's why you like to use a cementitious filler or grout. And there's actually a few grout colors that right, right out of the box are very similar to this stone. So this, this flaking process is called spalling. There's a better picture of it um, where I have it taped off just before I'm getting ready to, to apply the, the grout to fill it in.
So you obviously want to remove all the loose material either by pressure washing or, or picking it out. And, um, and then clean the voids real good with the vacuum and then, um, and then fill it real well. This is a flamed granite floor with, um, with a, I believe it was an acrylic top coat sealer. It's, e it's either acrylic or urethane. And I'm going to assume it's a, a solvent-based acrylic because there's a lot of companies making so-called stone sealers that are actually these lacquers, um, which is a solvent-based acrylic. And um, they will do this. They'll leave a nice finish, and everything will look great. And you'll, you'll make it to the bank, and the check will clear, and you'll be looking good for nine months or maybe even a year but then it's going to start to flake it's going to delaminate and you're going to have this where certain areas it comes off completely and in the areas where it doesn't come off and it just delaminates it's going to completely wash out the color of the stone you'll have this plastic type of a look and with quartzite and granite and other stones It'll cause the stone to start spalling because the stone will not be able to breathe the way it's supposed to breathe. So, um, anyways, the the shiny areas are the areas where the surface coating is still intact, although it is um, delaminated and causes stone to learn the colors, lose the color. The softer, unshiny un areas are the natural stone the way it's supposed to look. And just on a side note down, the lower edge, this is an expansion joint. This is a, a silicone, I mean a urethane um, filler put in so that the stone can expand and contract. Here's a close-up of spalling. And you can see how everything's kind of lost its color. The stone looks really boring except for that one little area about two inches in from the corner where the coating has delaminated and flaked off and there's the stone. You can actually see what it looks like and it's very pretty but you can't see it because there's all this um, crap on top, this, this uh, acrylic and even on top of the acrylic it's got a nice layer of mineral deposit buildup. So to remove this you'd have to use a, a methyl chloride um, stripper or you can get a safe stripper, a non-methyl chloride stripper and um, remove it. The only other way out is just to reseal it with another coat of this acrylic, solvent-based acrylic, and that'll kind of re-emulsify the stuff that's loose, the, the layer that's loose on top and soften that up and it'll it'll rebond it to the stone and it'll make it look um, decent once again but um, as a matter of principle I, I I have walked away from several jobs like this and said you know you get the guy that came out here to make this right or I'll fix it and I will make it right but I will not do it wrong and if I do come out here and make it right it's going to cost a whole bunch because those strippers are very messy and very expensive and take a long time to work with, especially out in the sun. So um, these are real pain in the butt jobs and, and I tend to just throw out a price that's so high um, I end up getting away with not having to do the job. Okay, this is a, a granite floor insoluble salt staining. This is where chlorides or nitrates from the mortar bed beneath the stone have wicked their way up into the stone and through the edge of the stone and have caused um, a darkening. Um, insoluble salt means what it says, that, that this, this salt, that these uh, chlorides are not soluble. That means they are not going to rinse out. 
there throughout the thickness of the stone and they are stable and um, this is permanent sometimes you won't see this until after you've done a cleaning and uh, it'll make you look really bad so you want to look for it and point it out and you want to make sure that nobody pins the responsibility on you for this problem if it's something that hasn't been seen beforehand. And again, this comes from a thick mortar bed installed outdoors <coughs> where um, where there's going to be a lot of water wicking into the mortar bed and then drying out and taking all those minerals from the from the mortar bed and transferring it into the stone. Um, very typical in granite and in limestone. Same floor, same problem. You can see it looks like the stone is wet, but it is actually not moisture at all. This this is in Hawaii and it hasn't rained at this point for maybe a couple of months in this area. And the surface temperature of this floor gets, you know, well over 100 degrees on a daily basis. So it's definitely not moisture. You can see on the risers of the steps there, the lighter spots, it's where it's actually starting to spall or flake. And this, this chloride staining will close the pores up on the stone and it will um, not allow the stone to breathe like it should. And then you'll you'll have this problem of spalling as well. Not big pieces because it's granite. Little tiny pieces are going to flake off, but it'll make the texture more rough than it's supposed to be. Um, this is a flamed texture, so you don't notice the spalling as much. But there were areas where they had it polished, and where it, when it does spall in the polished areas, then it tends to stick out like a sore thumb. This is the same problem on a limestone floor, kind of <coughs> over in the shadows. You can see it a little bit more. Um, and uh, just an overall darkening. This is where, as you can see, this little landscaped island where the landscaping is raised quite a bit from the adjacent um, hard floor surface and it has to get irrigated quite a bit <coughs> to stay nice and green like that. So all that moisture um, goes down and it wicks into the side of the concrete slab and into the mortar bed and into the stone and um, leaves all of its minerals behind that it, the irrigation water that has a whole bunch of silica in it. It's just leaving deposits inside the stone. This is more of the same problem. Um, this is after the stone's been cleaned. And um, it, this does have a little bit of moisture in it. This will lighten over the next couple of months. But most of this is going to stay the way it looks now because it's not um, something that's going to vaporize. This is in a shower. Uh, granite and it looks like somebody just took a shower but this shower has not been used for a couple of months and it is dry and so this is just the nitrates from and the chlorides from the mortar bed or the alkaline salts from the mortar bed that is the dry pack mortar one to three sand and cement, highly alkaline, just wicking up into the the tiles on the shower floor and starting to wick up the shower walls. This is a good example of color fading. This is the travertine floor and where you see those two holes, that's for the set pins for some doors, exterior interior doors on the left hand side is the interior floor on the right hand side 
is the exterior floor, and where you see the interior floor has been protected from the sun. You see one color in the exterior floor where it's been in the sun, you see another color. This is not the way it is because the exterior part of the floor has lost its finish. If you look at the reflection going across this floor, the finish is nice and even. So this is just a loss of color due to uh, intense UV rays. This is again a travertine, bone finish travertine. Uh, mineral staining. This is um, red dirt staining to be um, to be exact uh, with a Versailles pattern with a cushioned edge. And we saw a picture of this floor in a, in a previous slide. Um, it had to be cleaned with chemicals because you can see where it gets most dirty is in the recessed area of the joints where the cushioned edge is. And um, anyways, this is the red dirt that's pretty um, abundant in Maui, the island of Maui. And um, there's only a few chemicals that work, or one chemical that works in this. We're going to cover that in a later chapter. But this is a type of mineral staining, specifically red dirt, which is red because of iron which means it needs an acid to remove it. This is a um, travertine flag stone pattern. Uh, just showing next to next to a landscaped area in the in the in the foreground here. Um, where the irrigation has oversprayed, there's a low spot in the in the the uh, floor here, which is allowing a puddle, what we call a bird bath. And um, when the water dries, it goes into the sky, but the minerals stay behind, and they form over time. They form this this uh, dark mineral stain. This is highly, this area here, this is kind of reclaimed water using for the, for the um, irrigation. And uh, it's very, very high in silica. So these stains form very quickly in this certain resort neighborhood. <coughs> this is more mineral staining just through a low spot in the floor where there's been puddling and it's caused uh, oxidation of the limestone on the top level causing rust. So this is something that can be cleaned off. It's just a surface buildup or surface oxidation. This is um, extreme mineral staining on a limestone floor where there was a puddle, a low spot in the intersection of these grout joints. And um, the floor is actually, this is in the middle of a cleaning process where I'm applying extra chemical here to try to melt this silica buildup with um, ammonium bifluoride cleaner. But this is um, just typical of how it just kind of gathers along the edges and, and fills up the grout joints. Biological staining, this is some mold um, underneath the eaves of a house and um, some uh, plumeria trees where there's um, a, a certain type of uh, white fly that lives in them and has a, has a waste product that, that is sticky and then, um, then all sorts of dirt and um, growths attach themselves to that so um, but this this is a type of cleaning that comes off really easy with the alkaline cleaner or um, pressure washing but uh, your biological staining is usually going to be either black or green 
um, standard crack in the slab, you can tell that it's the slab and not the tile itself because it runs through several tiles. You'll see it go through the tile and then typically it'll it'll run over and it'll just follow a grout joint for a while and then it'll take off through a few more tiles. I like to repair the crack with grout or epoxy rather than replacing the tiles. When you replace a tile it'll always be a different color because it's just has patinaed over time and it ends up looking a lot worse replacing the tile than it does just repairing the crack itself. Uh, this is lippage. Um, the only way to repair this obviously is through grinding. Um, this is what we call an Audi. So this is what we call an any. Just kidding. But um, when you have a high tile, <coughs> like the previous slide, it's um, much easier to deal with because when you're going over it with your grinding <coughs> equipment, the high tiles, they just they just sort of buzz right off <coughs> um, because they're sticking up out of the plane, planing surface. These, the low tiles, these are the ones to look out for. These can be a real pain in the butt and very time consuming because what you're going to have to do is grind that entire area until this low spot goes away. So, um, you know, at times when you have a, a low corner like this that's real extreme, um, you're going to want to maybe even have the contractor replace that tile and pull it up and put another one in that's, that's sticking up high or flush. <clears throat> just because you don't want to have to stay there forever trying to get that low spot off and then you're going to have a wavy floor where you had to grind so much material just to flush out those two corners. It's just not worth it. Sometimes it's much quicker to have the tile replaced or even to replace the tile yourself if you're capable of that type of work. It's going to save time in the long run. But uh, actually, you know, that being said, I really, I haven't done that in a long time. I just kind of put my head down and grind, and um, my machine's very powerful. It ends up getting through it. But, you know, there's times that I wish I would have just pulled that tile and, and had it put in correctly. Uh, this is decomposition. This stone is a mica schist. Um, you can see the center of the, the largest tile there where it's completely deteriorated and eaten away. Um, you can actually take your your fingernail and scratch material and you could dig a little hole with your fingernail in this tile. It's so bad. Um, tile has not been sealed in a long time and it's just deteriorated through neglect. <coughs> this is um, this is slate. It is um, spalling. This is extreme spalling due to neglect, not being sealed in quite a long time and um, receiving so much direct sunlight that the natural oils in the slate have all just dissipated. And um, these oils are, are what binds the stone together. So um, this is an extreme case. You can see this riser piece here. You just touch that and it's going to fall apart. Um, before you start working on something like this, if you see this, um, you're going to want to um, you're going to want to make sure it's that everybody knows what the problem is and that you're not creating the problem because as you work on this tile, it's going to just fall apart. But you have to remove all this loose material so you can get it sealed. You want to seal 
<clears throat> the stuff that's still sound and that's still holding together. But we call this exfoliating or, or spalling, you know, more like extreme spalling. <clears throat> this is rising damp <clears throat> in a limestone facade. Uh, <clears throat> you can see on the little pebble stones down below the actual material of the um, the limestone. <clears throat> you can see efflorescence, that white line that's forming from the moisture. This is because this limestone has been overlapped by um, landscaping soil that's getting overwatered, <clears throat> and it's wicking up into the stone, causing all these problems. <clears throat> it should have been waterproofed or should have received some sort of flashing that would protect the limestone from this moisture. <clears throat> this is the stone, by the way, this is a striated finish, which we talked about before, and which you don't see very often. <clears throat> this is internal rusting in limestone, more specifically, this is cross-cut travertine. This was where uh, there was a flood from the earthquake that we had here in Hawaii, and the um, water heater broke, and this floor remained flooded for a long time. And it just merely caused the the um, the iron that's in the limestone to oxidize. This is another picture of it. <coughs> this is a tannin and uh, vandalin staining from the copper, the copper um, roof that drips down into the, the limestone. Actually, from the flashing, and I believe the wood. Um, the cedar from the roof is causing the tannin staining, so we have a combination of two due to the, the flashing and the cedar roofing. That's another picture of it. <coughs> this is where there was a flood from some heavy raining um, and then extreme staining from the mahogany uh, baseboards that were throughout the house. Uh, the mahogany is has a lot of tannin, and when it floods, most baseboards will be nicely finished on the surface that you see, but the edge that contacts the floor, there'll be a little gap there, and they usually don't seal that with caulking. And if water gets inside that gap and then leaches back out, it will take the color of the mahogany with it. So this is one of the reasons when you clean a floor with mahogany or redwood or cedar base, um, you need to be very careful to take the, the vacuum equipment that you use and suck out that crack at the, the, at the perpendicular joint between the floor and the baseboards and get that nice and dry, or you may come back the next day and see these nice orange stains that were caused by the moisture that got underneath the edge of the base. Same problem, different area of the house. This is a mineral scale buildup that is um, in a shower, dark emperor shower walls, um, and we, we're going to cover how to deal with that in a later chapter. And um, this is a little bit more, you can see inside the, the recessed area of the, the niche where it's really, really bad. Okay, this is mineral scale buildup around a, um, a gold-plated um, fixture on a laptop. And this actually comes off pretty easy just with a razor blade. Um, and that's sometimes all you can do because some, 
you don't want to take these off. The right way to do this work is to remove these fixtures and you can do your grinding and polishing right over the top and make it look brand new. But you always want to make sure to have somebody else do that because some of these fixtures have been on there a long time and you start to take them apart and everything can just kind of fall apart on you and then it becomes your responsibility. So you want to delegate that responsibility to someone else or or just don't touch it and do the best you can just using your fingers. This is a limestone floor that's been etched through um, many years of efflorescence, um, moisture coming from the mortar bed and leaving salt deposits on the stone which actually burns it in time. This is a pretty extreme case. Um, you'll see some after photos. We had to diamond sand it and then use honing compounds, but um, this is caused by just the mineral deposits that were left to sit on there and, and then get wet again and again and do their, their burning thing. Another picture of the damage. Pretty bad, pretty extreme damage. This required a good amount of sanding. And then this is the picture of that same area as the original photo. Um, after the treatment was done. And um, nice even finish, as you can see. And we got all the color back. Another acid etched or alkaline etched um, limestone floor looking pretty bad. Um, this is a good example of efflorescence, mineral salts deposits that were caused by extreme moisture getting below the tile and the moisture forcing its way on top and bringing with it the alkaline minerals from the mortar bed and the concrete below. It's more efflorescence. And that's the end of our introduction. Thank you.